Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. This is the number one question and answer show about medical coding airing on Tuesdays. So if you would like to submit your question for next week's Q&A Tuesday, comment below or shoot me an email. I will include that down in the description box below. So let's get started. All right, thank you to everybody who submitted a question. First question. Hi, do medical billers need to know anatomy and physiology? When it comes to what medical billers need to know, they need to know a lot because a lot of times errors can actually be stopped by the medical biller if it's coming from the medical coder or if it's coming from the provider and it's the biller that's submitting all the paperwork. A lot of stuff can be caught by the biller if they know what they're doing. So knowing anatomy, physiology, and medical terminology is key to this. This is not something that you can shortcut your way into, like as far as like learning medical billing first and then going on to be a coder and, oh, I don't need to know all of this other stuff just because I'm a biller. Just because you're a biller, it doesn't mean that you don't have to apply yourself in all the areas the same way that a medical coder does. Because you never know, maybe you might want to move up to being a medical coder. So there's always that. But I would highly recommend that anybody that's in the medical field know about medical terminology, anatomy, and physiology. That's just my advice. Next question. Hi, Blue. I am newly certified CCA, the Certified Coding Associate, and that is through the American Health Information Management Association, if you didn't know. And I will be testing for the CCSP as a Certified Coding Specialist Physician Based, uh, also with AHIMA, and at the end of the year. I work in anesthesia as a, an administrative assistant in the coding department and hope to transition to a coder early next year. I try to read as much as possible, but my eyes struggle to focus and I find my level of comprehension is best when listening. Are there any video resources you can recommend or a way to better to get better at reading for long periods of time? So like my number one recommendation would be YouTube. YouTube has plenty of different videos out there. Uh, look at some of the nursing videos and how they talk about like uh, medical terminology and things like that. There's also just medical school type um, videos that they talk about anatomy, physiology, medical terminology. It's okay to broaden your horizons. It doesn't necessarily have to be medical coding terminology or medical coding anatomy and physiology. It can be nursing, it could be PAs, it could be for medical school, it could be any of those. The basic thing that you want to do is to look at something, okay, and, and watch the video. As far as like um, staying focused and concentrated, sometimes I think when people are reading and they don't break it down into manageable chunks. They think that they need to uh, just tackle the whole thing and they don't break it out into something that is more manageable. If you are looking at a book and let's just say it's 100 pages and you need to get through this book, take 10 pages at a time. Work on 10 pages one day and then the next day another 10 pages. So this way it's not so long and so that you have an end goal and you have something that is manageable that you can work with, okay? Because I think trying to focus and concentrate on what you're reading and then just sort of doing it that way is what really throws people off and, and plays with their concentration. We live in a very digital age now where everything is the computer or the phone and we're constantly like this. And so breaking away from that and getting into a book that has no um, a, attractive light to it uh, is a struggle sometimes, but it is possible because the, the generation before this did it. <laughs> Generations before this did it. And I am very old school. I am into the books. That is what I do. I am more comfortable with books than I am doing things digitally. I've heard of people going through um, flashcards and they'll do the ones online where you can just flip. And to me, uh, you get more out of actually physically writing stuff down and, and doing it that way uh, rather than just trying to go through a, a flip thing on your phone or an app or whatever. But if it that's what works for you, that's what works for you. Um, in this case, if it's so much reading and you're, you're having a difficulty, you know, grasping and, and trying to keep it in and retaining it, record yourself reading passages so that way you can listen to it later on or you may not fully understand it right away when you're reading it the first time, 
But then if you record yourself and you listen to it later while you're doing something else like uh, taking a walk or you're, you're going to the gym or something like that, and you're listening to yourself, it's you're able to work with your brain and say, okay, we've read this, now we're hearing it, and now it's going to retain a little bit easier. At least that's just my opinion and my advice uh, when it comes to studying like that. So that's all I can offer you now. <laughs> all right, next one. With AHIMA, they are only sending the journal digitally through email. I wonder if this is now the only method they send their magazine. I'm old school and there's nothing like a real book or a magazine. So I don't know where the heck I have been, <laughs> but it's true. Uh, they are only sending the journal digitally now, which is very disappointing. I will say that. Uh, when it comes to reading, we are always on our computers or we are always on our phones, again, like I said. And so to have one more thing to read uh, online is, I don't know, guys, I, 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 I'm I always going to revert back to books and magazines and things like that. And yes, while it may be, well, you know, it's, it's, it's better for the environment and blah, blah, blah. I understand that. <laughs> but at the same time, come on. <laughs> so there is another, there is another uh, magazine. I was going to say record. <laughs> there is another magazine out there. It's called For the Record. If you are a member of AHIMA, the American Health Information Management Association, or AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders, your subscription is free to them, okay? So uh, it's got lots of really good articles, very helpful articles in it. And again, it's free. So if you are a member of either of those associations, that subscription is free. So, and if you aren't, it's okay because they do have where you can pay for it. Uh, so if you want to do that, click on the link below. All right, next question. Hi, Blue. Greetings from Vishnu. I'm from India. I have a CPC certified ED coder with more than two years experience and I'm currently working. Is there any diploma certification in health information management which helps me in securing a job in the public sector in India. Kindly guide me. If you haven't already guessed, and if you haven't seen my Instagram, where it's full of cowboy boots, I'm an American. I live in the U.S. And the cowboy boots should tip you off that I'm a Texan. <laughs> I'm not from India, so I don't know. Uh, that is a question that you'd have to find out there. You'd have to go to your local college or school or, or whatever they have in India and see if that, what they have out there. I can't answer that. I can only answer for what's in the US. And so I, I wouldn't be able to answer your question, but please look in your area to find that out. Next question. Hi, Blue. I have sort of a weird random question about medical coding, especially at any office setting. Are you allowed to turn off the blue light on your computer screen? I have been concerned about the constant blue light exposure and wondered if employers give you the option to use computers without blue light or adjusting the settings so that there is no blue light exposure. I don't know every employer in the world, in the US, so it's gonna depend. Uh, I know that in computers, a lot of them have that blue light setting where you can switch it off. There's also filters that you can use. Um, to to keep you from having so much blue light exposure i know in your cell phones that it, it's on there you can also uh, have the option of turning that off um, but i don't know if every phone does that or if every computer does that so you would have to ask uh, where you are applying and if that's a really big concern for you okay next question hi blue i'm a guy and i want to get into this field I do understand that it's mostly women in this field. I just want to know, is there any men doing medical coding that you know of? Yes, I do know a handful of men <laughs> who are medical coders. I do say that we do need more male medical coders because I think to balance out the field, I think there needs to be a good healthy mix of both men and women. Uh, but if you are a male and you you want to be a medical coder, welcome. <laughs> uh, I think it's great. I think it's great when men want to be medical coders as well, because like I said, it does balance out the male and female ratio. Uh, but just know that for the time being, uh, you may be in a minority as a male in the office. You may be 
the only male in the office. When I worked in this horrible little tin can of a room, there was 20 of us in there and there was one male supervisor. <laughs> and then for a time, there was only two males. There was one, uh, the supervisor, and then there was one male medical coder, but then he got moved to a, a an outside satellite clinic. So they were the only two men there. And you know, <laughs> you got a bunch of women around you. So if that doesn't scare you off, welcome. <laughs> Next question. Is it possible to get a coding job before certification? Absolutely. There's even jobs that I've talked about in the medical coding job listings explained videos that do say that you have to have certification within six months of hire. So if you are still in the program or in school for medical coding, medical billing and coding, they will let you in. It just depends. And you have to have a really good resume and you have to be very persistent. So, but yes, there are positions out there for people who don't have their credentials quite yet, um, but are getting them. So next question. Hi, Blue. Thank you for the advice. I'm a new CPCA currently searching for a coding job. It is not easy to find the job. Most of them require experience. I'm frustrated. I have applied so many places and got one phone interview but I didn't get the second phone interview. When it came to the interview, that was my worst part was how to answer the questions. So when you get your certification and you're out applying for jobs, yes, you are gonna see that the vast majority of places are going to ask you to have experience. However, um, when you are applying at these places, you need to be ready because they are going to test you. Every single place is going to give you an assessment test when you are applying. That is part of being a medical coder. It's not just, I just, I went through a program, I graduated and I got my certification now and now I'm ready to work and people can just hire me. No, you have to be able to answer the questions because they need to know um, what is your knowledge and your background. If you are brand new with no experience, they're more likely to take a chance on you if you can pass their assessment test. If you can't pass their assessment test, they're not gonna waste their time with you. And the reason is because not every place is going to train the coders well. And that, I'm just being very honest. There are some places out there that say, oh yes, we're accredited and you know we, we have a, a good instructor. And then you get into the program and the instructor is just basically proctoring from a book, not really teaching the people um, those critical thinking skills. And when you are a medical biller and coder, you need to have those critical thinking skills. I have mentioned this many, many times. So if you feel like you're not learning or you feel like, yes, you got your certification, but maybe you feel like the program that you went through just sort of trained you on how to pass a certification exam, but you still don't know what you're doing, then you need to work on building up your coding skills. And the way to do that is by checking out these um, these uh, coding workbooks. And I will leave a link down in the description box below for one that I recommend. And just work on the word problems or work on the coding problems or go back through your books that you were with in school and go through those um, work problems in there, the work, whatever they had, the workbooks or whatever. Uh, go through those and try to really start to understand what's happening and get yourself into a, a mindset of really, really grasping what's going on. Because book coding, yes, and real world coding is two different things. But when you are being tested and assessed in these uh, job interviews, they're asking basic questions. So you really do need to make sure that you're looking at basic, um, basic things and basic questions. So that way you can be ready whenever you are applying. Now, a lot of people will ask me, well, what are some of the questions that they ask you in the assessment test? I don't know. Every place is different. Um, I've worked in four jobs and in these four jobs, every single one of the assessment tests that I had to take was completely different <laughs> from the others. And it, it, so I've had ones that were 25 questions. I've had some that were 50 questions. They were, it was broken down into um, same day surgeries and then coding just uh, regular diagnosis, regular procedures, and then asking me a bunch of random questions like what was HIPAA and what is MSDRG and just basic things like that. So it's really going to depend on where you're applying but when you're applying, don't get nervous, okay? So when they give you this assessment test, just do the best you can. And in order to continue to prepare yourself while you're in your job search, 
like I said, go through the workbooks. I have a Patreon channel where I do uh, exercises and I talk about how I got my answer and I talk about different things on my Patreon channel. So I will plug my channel now <laughs> about it. Uh, and a uh, pledge level started just $1 per month and you get access to all that. I do crossword puzzles and I do all sorts of things on my Patreon channel. So I invite you to uh, check it out. And like I said, uh, different levels have different uh, more, more things, but the $1 level gets you access to everything. Higher pledge levels are going to get you one-on-one -on -one access with me if you need a tutor. Uh, that starts at a higher pledge level. So be sure to check out my uh, Patreon channel, you know, and maybe that will help you. But yes, don't get discouraged. Just continue to study and really try to understand the coding part um, when you are starting out because that is really what's going to help you and make you stand out when you are applying. Okay. Next question. Is it possible to do medical coding remotely living in Italy or any other foreign country. So when it comes to remote coding, you have to have experience and we've talked about this. Now, blue, it's the pandemic right now. Everybody's working at home. Yes, it's true. You can still get a job as a medical coder. If you apply at a place that you have to physically go nine times out of 10 right now, they're going to send you home because of this pandemic. And maybe places are not all ready to, to be open up fully again. Okay. So it just depends on, on where you're applying and where you're trying to work at. If they send you home, this is just going to be temporary. You are going to have to go back to the facility whenever they do decide to open their doors fully and bring everybody back on back home, right? Uh, <laughs> home base, basically. So with remote coding, you have to have experience because book coding and rural coding is two different things. If you're a brand new coder, you're not going to understand uh, the the advanced things that are going to that is going to be happening when you're doing remote coding. If you have to go to a place where you're like have to physically go and they send you home, they're going to understand that you're a brand new coder. Okay, I've had emails from several people who have gotten jobs in the middle of the of the, of the pandemic, <laughs> and uh, they were they're totally fine with it because they know this this is what they're up against. They've got a brand new coder. Uh, but they did very well, so that was why they got hired. And with this, um, there, there, there's a little bit of slack there, okay? But when you work remotely, because this is such a privilege, a lot of times you have to be within a certain radius of the home base, and you have to be able to be present for meetings. You have to be able to be working at a particular time. So if you're in Italy and the places in the U.S., they're going to expect you to be up. And if you're in that kind of place uh, in the U.S. time, which is why this does not work. Like, you know, overseas work does not work uh, for a lot of American companies because you have to be available when they're available. And again, you're going to have to be within a certain radius. And there's not um, the... The internet connection has to be secure. And that's something that can't always be guaranteed if you're living in a foreign country. So that's another thing too. This is HIPAA. These are people's private information. So that is something to think about. A lot of people will ask me that, you know, sometimes when people are retiring and they'll say, well, I want to retire to a foreign country and I work, want to work remotely. That's not possible. Um, but I don't know every employer in the world. So uh, you'd have to apply and see. But for what I know that I've been in the industry this long, over 10 years, that's slim to none that that would be able to happen. Okay. And the last question, I found your YouTube for your YouTube channel for coders. It has been very helpful. I'm hoping you can give me some advice. I have an associate's degree in radiologic technology. I have been an x-ray slash CT tech for 20 years. Will having this medical background help in getting a job, specifically working from home? From what I've read, companies prefer to hire those with several years of experience. Any advice would be great. Okay, so when you are an x-ray tech, x-ray techs are very special in the fact that their anatomy is going to be stellar. They are really good with anatomy um, and, of course, physiology, medical terminology. That's, that's really big, but anatomy is really big for them, which is good because when you're reading this documentation, to understand that <laughs> is really key. And so that's, that's a plus there. The second thing is if you are working in a facility and that's something that you want to do, start meeting with the 
uh, patient administration division people, right? Anybody that's head of the medical records, because those are the ones that are going to be doing the hiring for the medical coders. And if you can start to uh, get to know them, it's going to be a lot easier for you when you're applying uh, as a brand new coder with no previous experience in coding, but you have a relationship with maybe somebody that's in that um, that department that you want to work in and it's going to be a lot easier for them to say okay we'll go ahead and give you a chance because we know you we know your work ethic and things like that so that may be the case okay I'm not saying that's a guarantee every time but what I am saying is that you know uh, having having those good connections is key but again if you are trying to do this because you want to work remotely and you want to do that right out of the gate Trying to do medical coding with no previous experience and then you have nobody else around you to ask questions to is going to be very difficult. So if that's what you're trying to do, I'm just letting you know. I'm not trying to discourage anybody. I'm just letting you know that it is an uphill battle. And like I said, yes, there are people who have started with no previous experience and this is their first job and they're working remotely because of the pandemic. Uh, but... Maybe they have people that are on staff that are willing to be like, okay, well, we have, we know we have to answer this person's questions, or maybe their training was very good, but they don't have a lot of questions. There's a lot of factors, too many variables to really, really pin down anything. Okay. But that's just something that to, to think about, you know, uh, when you are first starting out, you are going to want to be around people. You are going to need to be around people so that you can ask questions because it's gonna be like a whole another ball game when you get out in the real world, because you're gonna feel like you don't know anything, right? You didn't learn anything. That's how it's gonna feel in the beginning. I'm just saying, because that is the feeling of a lot of coders, okay? So that is just my advice on that one. But I will be doing uh, some more videos this week about jobs <laughs> and all the things that go along with it. Uh, so I hope you'll continue to join me this week. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. If you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider, or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see you all next time. Bye.